standards the same for all uh, intelligence analysts across the various agencies? There's a broad set of intelligence community promulgated standards for all of us, and then there are specific issues associated, for example, with a particular authority that you're using to collect the information in the first place. So, uh, Jim, the same thing with your, your agency, your analysts would have same similar type of standards? Correct. That's one of the really good things that's happened since 9-11, especially since 2004, is the adoption of a common set of tradecraft okay. uh, provisions. So I'm a CPA, and we have generally, astounded, generally accepted accounting standards, which are promulgated across a variety of things. Are those same standards publicly promulgated, or is, but, but generally disseminated through all of your analysts, I would assume, would have some sort of a test that they know those standards? I think the specifics of the IC promulgated standards are classified, but I could take that one for the okay. record, sir. Um, when the IC attributes a hacking to a particular actor, you do that through generally forensic evidence. But when it comes to trying to determine intent of uh, foreign leaders, can you walk us through how the NSA does that or the FBI does that? Um, we assess the, the range of information that we've a collected in an attempt to generate understanding as to not only what has occurred, but part of the intelligence professional profession is also trying to understand why, what was the intent. We'll use the range of information we have available to us while we're primarily a single source organization. It's one reason why organizations like CIA, the Defense Intelligence Agency, which take multiple sources to try to put together a, a complete picture. So we're just one component of a broader effort. I would call me anything different than that? No, oh, it's intent. about putting together a puzzle. Sometimes from forensics alone, you can get a pretty good indication as to what they must be intending to accomplish. Other times it requires human sources and additional uh, signals intelligence to give you that sense. So both of you agree, though, it's, uh, it's rarely a precise art or a precise science of determining intent of any foreign leader. That's correct. All of intelligence Judgment. work requires judgment. That's at the, at the center of it. But I will say in some cases, it's a much clearer case than in others. There are that depends some on, places that depends where it's very on clear. the sources you have inside a particular foreign leader's shop. I'm not going to get into the specifics. Well, it's just in general, if you had somebody who was next door neighbor, never mind. Um, pivoting to the January 7th, uh, January 6th, uh, intelligence community assessment, uh, both your agencies agree with the assessment that the Russians' goal uh, was to undermine the public faith in the U.S. democratic process. Is that still your assessment? Yes. Yes. Same assessment said that the uh, uh, Russians' uh, goal was to further was wanted to denigrate Secretary Clinton and harm her electability and potential presidency, and that Putin wanted to discredit Secretary Clinton because he publicly blamed her since 2011 for inciting mass protests against his regime in late 2011 and early 2012. You both still agree with that assessment? Yes. Yes. And then finally, uh, Admiral Rogers, that assessment went on to say that President Putin and the Russian government aspire to help President, I guess it had been candidate Trump at the time, President-elect Trump's election chances when possible by discrediting Secretary Clinton. You had a lower um, confidence, confidence level. level. Is that still the case? Yes, sir. Can you tell the uh, group why you were... I'm not going to get into the specifics in an unclassified form, but for me it boiled down to the level and nature of the sourcing on that one particular judgment was slightly different to me than the others. All right. Um, to be clear, Mr. Conaway, we, well, we, we all agreed with that judgment. We all agreed with Yeah, but, but, but you yeah. really agreed, yeah. and he almost really agreed. <laughs> Not terms our folks I, use, I, but I, I guess. Not a term of art. I got you, sir. Um, Director Comey, in, uh, in terms of laying out those three assessments, um, and whether or not the IC was consistent in its view of those three assessments across the entire campaign. Can we walk through kind of the FBI's walk uh, down that path? Um, did, as of early December of 16, did the FBI assess that uh, uh, the uh, active measures were to undermine, the, by the Russians were to undermine the faith in the U.S. democratic process? Had you come to that conclusion by early December? I think that's right, December of last year. 16, yes, yeah. sir. I think we were at that point, yes. And then active measures conducted against Secretary Clinton uh, to den denigrate her, hurt her, pres her uh, campaign, and also undermine her presidency. Was that Correct. Mean? All right. And then uh, the conclusion that active measures were taken specifically to help President Trump's campaign. 
you had that, uh, by early December, you already had that uh, conclusion? Correct. That they wanted to hurt our democracy, hurt her, help him. I think all three we were uh, confident in at least as early as December. Okay. The, uh, the, par the, the paragraph that's given me a little concern there in terms of just the timing of when all of that occurred, because I'm not sure if we went back and got that exact same January assessment six months earlier, it would have looked the same because you say, when we further assess Putin and the Russian government developed a clear preference for President-elect Trump. Any idea when that clear preference in the analysis, when did that get into the lexicon of when you talk back and forth among yourselves on a, on a classified basis? I don't know for sure, but I think that was a fairly easy judgment for the community. Uh, he, Putin hated Secretary Clinton so much that, that the flip side of that coin was he had a clear preference for the person running against the person he hated so much. Yeah, and that might work on Saturday afternoon when the, my wife's Red Raiders are playing the Texas Longhorns. <laughs> she really likes the Red Raiders. But all the rest of the time, I mean, I, you, you, the, the logic is that because he really didn't like uh, President, the candidate Clinton, that he automatically liked Trump. That assessment's based on um, what? Well, it's based on more than that, but part of it is, and we're not going to get into the details of it here, but part of it is the logic. Whoever the Red Raiders are playing, you want the Red Raiders to win. By definition, you want their opponent to lose. I know, but this says that that you wanted both of them, you wanted her to lose, wanted him to win. Is that right? Is that they're what inseparable. You right? It's a two. It's a two-person right, right. event. I got you. So I'm just wondering when you decided you wanted him to win. Well, logically, when he wanted her to lose, he wanted her. No, no, no. I'm not talking about him. I'm Putin. I got that. I got that. But the question is, when in this clear? Well, then let me finish up then. So we go through that sentence about the clear preference for Donald Trump, and we don't know exactly when you guys decided that was the case. Then it says, when it appeared to Moscow that Secretary Clinton was likely to win the election, the Russian influence campaign then focused on undermining her expected presidency. So, um, and then the next sentence says, the gov gov Russian government aspired to help President-elect Trump election chances. So when did they not think she was going to win? Well, the assessment of the intelligence community was as the summer went on and the polls appeared to show that Secretary Clinton was going to win, the Russians sort of gave up and simply focused on trying to undermine her. It's your Red Raiders. You know they're not going to win, so you kind of hope key people on the other team get hurt so they're not such a tough opponent down the road. And so there was at some so point... So you believe that the FBI was consistent through early December and on that that was the case? that they, they uh, assessed that they really wanted Trump to win it and were working to have him win and her lose. Yes, our analysts had a view that I don't believe changed from late fall through to the report on January 6th that it had those three elements. All right. So then on December the 9th, well in advance of the January 6th deal, the uh, uh, Washington Post put out an article, their lead sentence was, that this, and again, CIA, they're not here today, but we hope we'll have them next week, concluded in a secret assessment that Russia intervened in the 16 election to help Donald Trump win the presidency rather than to undermine the confidence in the electoral system, rather than just undermine it. They don't mention Ms. Clinton at all. And then it says, uh, to help Trump get elected, uh, the U.S. senior uh, briefed on the intelligence position, to, uh, the, U.S. Senior, the U.S. official briefed by, briefed on intelligence presentation to U.S. senators said that's the consensus view. How much did it, this, this is written by a guy named Adam Entos, Elaine something, and Greg Miller. Did they help draft the, July, the January 6th document the, the for reporters? the Intel Committee? I'm sorry? Did, the, did those writers from the Western Post help you write the January 6th uh, assessment? No, they did not. I wonder how they got almost the exact language on, Jan on December the 9th. It hadn't been written yet. I, I don't know. This is the peril of trying to comment on newspaper articles that report to report classified information. I can't say much about them. They're often wrong. Yep. You mentioned earlier in one of our uh, hearings that when anybody uses the I can't talk because I'm uh, bound by a uh, position of anonymity or whatever, that really is code for breaking the law, uh, generally, right? When somebody says I'm talking 
to a reporter. I'm just glad somebody secret, uh, you know, secret information. You can't tell, the reporter can't tell who it is because, as Mr. Gowdy was saying earlier, uh, speaking on a condition of anonymity, that really should be interpreted because I'm breaking the law and I don't want to be outed. Is that a fair statement? Sometimes. I think there are other motives behind people requesting anonymity, All but right. that can be one of them. So it's your statement to us that then that the FBI was consistent in its assessment that they denigrate the U.S. electoral process, hurt Hillary and her potential candidacy, and, co and, co and concurrent across all of that, that they intended to help Trump. That's your testimony this morning? Correct. Thank you. Go back. Mr. King. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, if you could yield me a few minutes into the next round, so I'll, I'll just start with this, make the comment. First of all, let me thank Director Comey and Admiral Rogers for being here today and for what I believe has been the cooperation you've always given this committee. So thank you very much for that and for your service. Uh, Director Comey, I think, you know, we're in a predicament here today. I understand your situation where you can't comment on the investigation, and yet we can have various scenarios laid out which could go on for months and months and months without anyone being able to disprove them until the investigation is completed. I, I would just like to use the example, for instance, we could have said that in uh, uh, 2012, President Obama was overheard in a microphone telling Medvedev that if I'm re-elected, tell Vladimir we can work out better arrangements. Uh, we know that he uh, ridiculed candidate Romney in the 2012 election when Romney said that he thought Russia was still a threat. And then in 2013, we saw that basically President Obama invited the Russians into Syria when they've been pretty much removed from the Middle East 40 years before. And also, uh, as far as aid to Ukraine, as far as I recall, the Obama administration always refused to give lethal, lethal aid to Ukraine. And it can be argued that the Republican platform in 2016 was actually stronger than the Democratic platform on that. So again, if, we, if there was an investigation going on of the Obama administration, we could lay out all these scenarios and say, well, that proves something, or it might prove something. <clears throat> and until the investigation was completed, that type of almost possibly slanderous comments could be made. So I, I would just, again, if uh, uh, I'm not asking you, to, you know, to hurry the investigation along, you have to do what you have to do, but I, I guess I could ask you just in the remaining moments I have uh, in this round, uh, I know that, I guess it was just two weeks ago, the director Clapper said that uh, as far as he knows, all the evidence he's seen there's no evidence of any collusion at all between the Trump campaign and the Russians. Now, obviously, a detailed, exhaustive report was put out uh, talking about Russian influence in the campaign. All of the intelligence uh, apparatus had input into that. Do either you or Admiral Rogers have any reason to disagree with the conclusion of General Clapper that there's no evidence of collusion between the Russians and the Trump campaign? Mr. King, it's not something I can comment on. Likewise, I'm not going to comment on an ongoing investigation's conclusions. But again, you're not going to disagree with General Clapper, you're just not going to comment. And the reason I'm pointing that out is that's sort of the situation, you know, the other way around, that when you can't comment on something, often there's an inference out there that because the person's name is brought up, because he may have worked for somebody at a certain time, that there's a guilt implied <clears throat> in that. So that's the problem. I'm not in any way being critical of either of you. I'm just saying this is a situation which I think can be damaging to the country and does advance the Russian interests of trying to destabilize democracy and cause a lack of confidence in our system. With that, I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Chairman yields back. I recognize Mr. Schiff for 15 minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just have a couple of follow-up questions before I pass to Representative Sewell. Um, it wasn't simply that the Russians had a negative preference against Secretary Clinton. They also had a positive preference for Donald Trump. Isn't that, isn't that correct? Correct. Um, and I want to ask you to say whether this is an accurate characterization of Mr. Trump. I won't put you in that spot. Uh, but would it be logical for the Kremlin to prefer a candidate that disparaged NATO uh, to be President of the United States? You're not going to put me in that spot, you said? I'm happy, yes. I'm happy with that. I'm happy with that. I'm not going to put you in the spot of, of answering whether this is an accurate characterization of Mr. Trump's views, but it would be logical for the Kremlin to want someone who had a dim view of NATO. Is that right? I, all kidding aside, I don't think that's something I should be answering. I mean, that's, beyond, that's beyond my responsibilities. Well, what, what, is, uh, what is the Russian view of NATO? Do they like NATO? Do they want to see NATO strong? Well, again, I w I, I'm sure you have already spoken to people who are greater experts than I, but, yeah, they don't like NATO. They think NATO encircles them and threatens them. 
And uh, would they have a preference for a candidate that expressed an openness to repealing the sanctions over Ukraine? And I don't want to get into business of commenting on that. I know. Well, then let me ask you this way, Director. Would they like to see the sanctions on Ukraine go away? Yes. Would they have a preference for a candidate who expressed open admiration for Putin? And I hope you'll reformulate the question. Mr. Putin would like people who like him. Uh, would they have a preference for a candidate who encouraged Brexit and other departures from Europe? Would they like to see more Brexits? Yes. And have the Russians in Europe demonstrated a preference for business people as political leaders with the hope that they can entangle them in financial interests or that they may allow their financial interests to take precedence over the interests of the countries in Europe they represent? In our joint report, we recount that the Russians, that, that President Putin has expressed a preference for business leaders in uh, leading other governments and mentions Gerhard Schroeder and, um, I'm going to forget one, Berlusconi. Oh, Berlusconi, because he believes they're people that are uh, more open to negotiation, easier to deal with. Uh, at this point, let me yield to uh, Representative Sewell. I'd like to continue my questioning, uh, the line of questioning on Michael Flynn. Um, I'm sure you can understand my concern that Mr. Flynn not only failed to disclose the contacts with the Russian ambassador, but he said he did not remember whether he discussed sanctions against Russia with that ambassador. And I find that really hard to believe. And wouldn't you think that at the height of our concern about Russian hacking, that Mr. Flynn would have remembered meeting with the Russian ambassador and would have, been, and would have told him to stop meddling in our affairs, but that didn't happen? Did it? So well, that's not something I can answer. Not only did Mr. Flynn not remember talking to the Russian ambassador, and not only did he not remember what they talked about, he also appeared to have lied to Vice President-elect Mike Pence all about it. Uh, now, Mr. Comey, do you think that Mr. Flynn's failure to disclose the communication and contact he had with the Russian ambassador and their topic of conversation, along with a blatant lie to Vice President Pence, meet the standard for an investigation by the FBI? I have to give you the same answer. I'm not going to comment. Now, I know, Director Comey, that you probably can't comment on this as well, but I think it's really important that we review a short timeline and that's based on press reportings uh, because we need to get this for the public record, I think. So on December 25th, 2016, Mr. Flynn reportedly exchanged text messages with the Russian ambassador. On December 28th, 2016, Mr. Flynn reportedly spoke on the phone with the Russian ambassador. By then, it was pretty clear that the Obama administration was going to take actions against Russia. On December 29th, 2016, Mr. Flynn reportedly spoke on the phone with the Russian ambassador again. That day, the Obama administration expelled 35 Russian operatives from the United States and announced new sanctions. We also know from press reportings that sometime in December, Mr. Flynn met in person with the Russian ambassador at Trump Tower and that Mr. Trump's son-in-law, Jared Kirshner, was also there. The purpose of the meeting was to, quote, establish a line of communication, end quote, with the Kremlin. I should add that the White House and Mr. Flynn didn't disclose this December face-to-face -face meeting until this month. On January 20th, uh, January 12th, sorry, uh, 2017, press reported that Mr. Flynn contacted the Russian ambassador again. And on January 15th, 2015, Vice President-elect Mike Pence stated on several Sunday morning shows regarding Mr. Flynn's conversation with the ambassador, quote, what I can confirm having spoken to him about it is that those conversations that happened to occur around the time that the United States took action to expel diplomats had nothing whatsoever to do with those sanctions, end quote. On January 26, the, ex the acting Attorney General Sally Yates reportedly told Mr. President Trump's um, White House counsel, who immediately told President Trump, that Mr. Flynn was vulnerable to Russian blackmail because of discrepancies between Vice President-elect Pence's public statement and Mr. Flynn's actual discussions. On February 10th, President Trump denied knowledge of this. 
telling reporters on uh, Air Force One, quote, I don't know about that, end quote, in response to questions about Mr. Flynn's conduct. The White House also publicly denied that Mr. Flynn and the Russian ambassador discussed sanctions. And of course, on February 13th, 2017, Mr. Flynn resigned as National Security Advisor. Now, Director Comey, all of these accounts are open source press reportings. Given Russians' longstanding desire to cultivate relations with influential U.S. persons, isn't the American public right to be concerned about Mr. Mr. Flynn's conduct, his failure to, to disclose that contact with the Russian ambassador, his attempts to cover it up, and what looks like the White House's attempts to sweep this under the rug? Don't we as the American people deserve the right to know? And shouldn't our FBI investigate such claims? I can't comment. I, I understand people's curiosity about our work and intense interest in it, and as Mr. King said, oftentimes speculation about it, but we can't do it well or fairly to the people we investigate if we talk about it, so I can't comment. I'd like to turn um, to another topic about Mr. Flynn, his failure to disclose until pressured last week um, by my colleagues on the House Oversight and Government Relations Committee. Uh, government Reforms Committee, payments he received from Russia for his 2015 trip to the 10th anniversary gala of RT, the Russian-owned propaganda media outlet. According to uh, the January uh, 2017 declassified IC assessment report, RT's criticism of the United States was, quote, the last facet of its broader and long-standing anti-U.S. messaging likely aimed at undermining viewers' trust in the U.S. democratic procedures, end quote. This January assessment points out that this was a strategy that Russia employed um, going back to before the 2012 elections, according to the IC assessment. So, Admiral Rogers, am I right that the RT is essentially owned by the Russian government? And how long has the intelligence community been looking at RT as an arm of the Russian government? So we're certainly aware and have been for some period of time of the direct connections between the Russian government and RT individuals. We're aware of monetary flow and other things. We have and and how long have you known about that? A few months? A few years? I mean, how long has the this United States... Some number of years. I apologize, ma'am. I just don't know off the top of my head. Um, aren't I right to assume then that the former director of DIA the Defense Intelligence Agency, Mr. Flynn, would have been aware that RT's role as an anti-U.S. Russian propaganda outlet when he agreed to speak at their anniversary gala in 2015. Isn't it reasonable position. to assume that I'm he would know? I'm not in a position to comment on the knowledge of something else from another person, ma'am. Director Comey, would it be unusual for a foreign government official to be to get paid by a foreign adversary to attend such an event? And would it be unusual and raise some questions at the FBI if that person failed to disclose the payments received for that trip? I don't know in general, and as to the specific, I'm, I'm just not going to comment. Yes, sir. I understand that you can't comment, but I'd like to read an exchange between Mr. Flynn and a Yahoo News correspondent from July 2016 regarding his trip to Russia. Uh, during uh, the RT event. The correspondent asks, were you paid for that event? Then there was a uh, back and forth for a bit, and then Mr. Flynn said, quote, yeah, I didn't take any money from Russia, if that's what you're asking me, end quote. So, Director Comey, isn't it true that the House Oversight Committee last week received information and released publicly that Mr. Flynn accepted nearly $35,000 in speaking fees and traveling fees from RT, this government, uh, Russian government-owned media outlet. I believe I've seen news accounts to that effect. Moreover, isn't it also true that according to the emoluments clause of the United States Constitution, a person holding any office of profit or trust cannot accept gifts or payments from a foreign, for, from a foreign country? And doesn't the DOD, the Department of Defense, uh, prohibit retired military officers from taking any consulting fees? 
gifts, traveling expenses, honorariums or salary from a foreign government, including commercial enterprises owned by or controlled by a, a foreign government, like RT. It's not something I can comment on. Can you, can you speak to whether or not the emoluments clause would apply to someone like Mr. Flynn, a retired three-star general? I can't. So isn't it, uh, I, I just find it to be really hard to believe uh, that given the emoluments clause does apply to retired officers uh, like Mr. Flynn, uh, I can't believe that Mr. Flynn, a retired military officer, would take money from the Russian government in violation of the United States Constitution. And I believe that such violations worthy of a criminal investigation by the FBI. What level of proof do we need in order for us to have a criminal investigation by the FBI of Mr. Flynn? I can't comment on that. Shouldn't the American people be concerned? Uh, what, I, 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 I think that it's really hard for us to fathom that he wouldn't know that he should have disclosed that he received $35,000 as a part of, um, of a speaking engagement to RT, the Russian U.S anti-propaganda outlet. I can't comment on that, Ms. Sewell. My final line of questioning is in regard to Mr. Flynn working as an agent of a foreign power. Now, Director Comey, following on Mr. Himes' line of questioning, am I correct that the Foreign Agents Registration Act requires that individuals who lobby on behalf of a foreign government must register with the United States government? I believe that's correct. I know I keep saying I'm, a, I'm not an expert. The reason I'm saying that is it, it, I don't know exactly how they define things like lobbying in the statute, but as a general matter, if you're going to represent a foreign government here in the United States touching our government, you should be registered. And isn't it true that just last November 2016, Mr. Flynn was working as a foreign agent doing work that principally benefited the government of Turkey, and yet he didn't report it until just last week? I can't comment on that. Isn't it true that Mr. Flynn was reportedly paid over half a million dollars for this work? Same answer. And isn't it true that the Trump White House, on at least two occasions, was asked by Mr. Flynn's lawyers whether he should report that work, the work that he was doing on behalf of the Turkish government, and yet the administration didn't give him any advice to the contrary? Do you know anything about that? I have to give you the same answer. So, Director Comey, I know you uh, cannot discuss whether any investigations are ongoing with U.S. persons, and I respect that. I think it's important, though, that the American people understand the scope and breadth of what, in public, open source press reportings of Mr. Flynn's um, actions that led to his resignation. And while we can't talk about whether there are an investigation, I believe that we here at HIPSI, at the House Permanent Select Committee on Intelligence must put those facts into the public domain. And they are, one, that Mr. Flynn lied about his communication with the, with the Russian ambassador. Secondly, that Mr. Flynn lied about taking money from the Russian government. And thirdly, that Mr. Flynn, at a minimum, did not disclose work as an agent of, the foreign, of a foreign power. And that the White House did not help in this concern. So, gentlemen, it's clear to me that Mr. Flynn should be under criminal investigation, and I know you cannot comment, but I believe it is my duty as a member of this committee to comment to the American people that, this, that his engagement of lying and failure to disclose really important information and contacts with the foreign ambassador do rise to the level of, uh, of, um, of disclosure and, to me, criminal intent. So I, I say this to say that the American people deserve to know the full extent of Mr. Flynn's involvement with the Russians and the extent to which it influenced the 2016 election. I believe our democracy requires it. <clears throat> Thank you. I, I yield back to my ranking member. Time's expired. Uh, recognize myself for 15 minutes. Uh, Mr. Comey and Mr. Rogers, uh, you both said that the Russians had, uh, they favored Donald Trump this election, and you made that change from the beginning of December. It was not that they were trying to help Donald Trump, but that changed by Jan early January. Mr. 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 Conaway talked about that. Do, do Russians... I don't, I, don't uh, agree, I don't agree with that. I'm going to make sure I didn't misspeak earlier. 
We didn't change our view from December to early January. We, the FBI, and I don't know that anybody else did on the IC team. I mean, from my perspective, some, we didn't at some have point, a fully at some point the assessment until the end of December. At and some point, the assessment changed January from from going from just trying to hurt Hillary Clinton to know that they were actually trying to help Donald Trump get elected. That was early December, as far as I know, and then by January, you had all changed your mind on that. Well, that, that's not my recollection, that's Mr. Not Chair. my recollection either, sir. Okay. So, is it? Uh, do Russians historically prefer Republicans to win over Democrats? I don't know the answer to that. Yeah, I don't know the answer to that. Did the Russians prefer Mitt Romney over Barack Obama in 2012? I don't know that we ever did drew a formal analytic conclusion. Did the Russians prefer John McCain in 2008 over Barack Obama? I never saw a U.S. intelligence community analytic position on that issue. Don't you think it's ridiculous to say that, for anyone to say that the Russians prefer Republicans over Democrats? I didn't think that that's what you just heard us say. I apologize, sir. I, I hope you didn't hear us to say that. I, we don't know in those particular races, and I, I'm not qualified enough. To I'm just asking a general question. I mean, wouldn't it be a little preposterous to say that historically, going back to Ronald Reagan and all that we know uh, about maybe who the Russians uh, would prefer, that somehow the Russians uh, prefer Republicans over, over Democrats? I, th there is, I'm, I'm not going to discuss it in an unclassified form, in the classified segment of the reporting vision version that we did, there is some analysis that discusses this, because remember, this did come up in, in our assessment on the Russian piece. I'm not going to discuss this in an unclassified Mr. form. Mr. King. <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, uh, and I would just say on that, because again, we're not going into the classified sections, that indicating that historically Russians have supported Republicans, and I know that language is there, to me puts somewhat of a cloud over the entire report. It seems to indicate the direction it was going in. But anyway, let me just say this for the record, and I know what your answer is going to be, but I have to get the statement on the record. Uh, on March 15th, former acting director of CIA, Mike Morrell, who was the acting director under President Obama, and put it on the record, I've had differences with Mike Morrell in the past, but he was asked about the question of the Trump campaign conspiring with the Russians. And his answer was, there is smoke, but there is no fire at all. There's no little campfire. There's no little candle. There's no spark. Do you agree with Mr. Morrell? I can't comment, Mr. King. Admiral Rogers. I'm not going to comment on an ongoing investigation. And I understand that. That was my way of getting on the record, so I appreciate that. Uh, you were talking about the significance of uh, leaks and how important it is we stop them. And to me, and I've been here a while, I've never seen such a sustained period of leaks. Going back to December when uh, not the Intelligence Committee, but the Washington Post was told the conclusion of the uh, report. That's number one. Uh, what it was going to be. Uh, we have situations in the New York Times where they talk of meetings, they talk about transcripts, they talk about conversations. There was one in particular where it spoke about Trump campaign individuals meeting with Russian intelligence agents. And again, uh, Director Comey, I don't know if you can comment on this, but uh, the White House Chief of Staff said, I guess, that day or the next day, that Mr. McCabe from your office went to him at the White House and told him that that story was BS. Is there any way you can comment on whether or not Mr. McCabe told that to Mr. Priebus? I can't, Mr. King, but I can agree with your general premise. Leak, leaks have always been a problem. I read over the weekend uh, something from George Washington and Abraham Lincoln complaining about them. But I do think in the last six weeks, couple of months, there's been at least... A, apparently a lot of conversation about classified matters that's ending up in the media. Now, a lot of it is just dead wrong, which is one of the challenges because we don't correct it. Um, but it does strike me there's been a lot of people talking, or at least reporters saying people are talking to them in ways that have uh, struck me as um, unusually active. Yeah, so I, I, I fully understand the media's fascination with palace intrigue, with uh, uh, which uh, faction at the White House is trying to outdo the other. That's all to me, that's all legitimate. That goes with the game. But if you're talking about leaking classified information, if you're talking about leaking investigations, 
uh, I mean, I, you stated today that there is an FBI investigation going on. So if the New York Times can be believed, I would think it would have to be somebody from the FBI who was telling them about these purported meetings, which Mr. McCabe said was BS, uh, with Russian intelligence agencies. So somebody who was familiar with that investigation spoke to the New York Times. And so I use that as an example. And also one where, the, to me, there's a smaller universe. I think it was on January 6th when yourself, Admiral Rogers, uh, Director Brennan, and General Clapper went to Trump Tower to meet with President Trump. The media reports are that at the end of that meeting, Director Comey, you presented uh, President-elect Trump with a copy of the now infamous or famous dossier. And I don't know how many people were in the room, but within hours, that was leaked to the media, and that gave the media the excuse or the rationale to publish almost the entire dossier. Uh, do you cons does that violate any law? I mean, you were at a classified briefing with the president-elect of the United States, and it had to be a very, very small universe of people who knew that you handed them that dossier, and it was leaked out within hours. Are you making any effort to find out who leaked it, and do you believe that that constituted a criminal violation? I can't say, Mr. King, except I can answer in general. Yeah. Any unauthorized disclosure of classified conversations or documents is potentially a violation of the law and a serious, serious problem. I've spent most of my career trying to figure out unauthorized disclosures, where they came from. It's very, very hard. Oftentimes, it doesn't come from the people who actually know the secrets. It comes from one hop out, people who heard about it or were told about it. And that's the reason so much information that purports to be accurate classified information is actually wrong in the media, because the people who heard about it didn't hear about it right. But it is an enormous problem whenever you find information that is actually classified in the media. We don't talk about it because we don't want to confirm it, but I do think it should be investigated aggressively and, if possible, prosecuted so people take as a lesson this is not okay. This behavior can be deterred, and it's deterred by locking some people up who have engaged in criminal activity. Well, could you say it was obviously Admiral Rogers was in the room, you were in the room, General Clapper was in the room, and Director Brennan was in the room. Were there any other people in the room that could have leaked that out? I mean, this isn't a report that was circulated among 20 people. This isn't unmasking of names where you may have 20 people in the NSA and 100 people in the FBI. It's not putting together a report or all the intelligence agencies. This is four people in a room with the President elect of the United States. And I don't know who else was in that room. And that was leaked out, it seemed within minutes or hours, of you handing him that dossier. And it was so confidential, if you read the media reports, that you actually handed it to him separately. So, and believe me, I'm not saying it's you. But I'm saying it's a small universe of people that would have known about that. And if it is a disclosure of classified information, if you're going to start with investigating leaks, to me that would be one place where you could really start to narrow it down. And again, Mr. King, I can't comment because I do not ever want to confirm a classified conversation with a president or president-elect. I can tell you my general experience, it often turns out there are more people who know about something than you expected at first, both because there may be more people involved in the thing than you realize, not, not this particular, but in general, and more people have been told about it or heard about it or staff have been briefed on it, and those echoes are, in my experience, what most often ends up being shared with reporters. Well, could you tell us who else was in the room that day? I'm sorry? Could you tell us who else was in the room with you that day? No. Because I'm not going to confirm that there was such a conversation, because then I might accidentally confirm something that was in the newspaper. But could you tell us who was in the room, whether or not there was a conversation? No, I'm not confirming there was a conversation. In a classified setting, I might be able to share more with you, but I'm not going to confirm any conversations with either President Obama or President Trump or when President Trump was the president-elect. Well, not the conversation or even the fact that you gave it to him, but can you, can you tell us who was in the room for that briefing that you gave? That you're saying later ended up in the newspaper? Yes. So my talking about who was in the room would be a confirmation that what was in the newspaper was classified information. I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to help people who did something that, that is unauthorized. Yeah, but we all know that the four of you went to Trump Tower for the briefing. I mean, that, that's not classified, is it? How do we all know that, though? Okay. Yeah. Okay. You know, you can, you can see the predicament we're in here. No, I get it. <laughs> I get it. But we are duty-bound to protect classified information, both in the first, when we get it, and then to make sure we don't accidentally jeopardize classified information by what we say about something that appears in the media. Well, if, if they're listening, I would just advise that uh, Director Clapper and Director Brennan will be asking them the same questions last week, uh, next week, and perhaps they can give us some answers. Chairman, I, I you're back. Gentleman yields back. Uh, Mr. Lobiondo is recognized. 
Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, Director Comey, Admiral Rogers. Thank you for your service and thank you for being here. Um, understanding that uh, what both of you have been saying about the classified nature of uh, the investigation, the classified nature of the topics we're talking about, um, can you give us any indication of when we, the committee, may, in a classified setting, um, know something from you? Would we have ongoing updates? Uh, Mr. Lobiondo, I don't know uh, how long the work will take. I can't commit to updates. As you know, uh, I have briefed the committee as a whole on some aspects of our work, and I've briefed in great detail the chair and the ranking. I don't know. I can't, I can't predict or commit to updates. But I, as your work goes on, we're in constant touch with you, and uh, we'll do the best we can, but I can't commit to that as I sit here. So as the um, House Intelligence Committee and the Senate Intelligence Committee are conducting uh, our bipartisan investigations and looking wherever it may lead, uh, with individuals or circumstances, if you, through the FBI investigation, come across a circumstance with an individual or a situation, would we be made aware of that under normal course of business? Not necessarily, but it's possible. Okay. Um, so can you, uh, either Director Comey or Admiral Rogers, uh, tell us what we are doing or what we should be doing to protect against Russian interference in future elections or any meddling with our government, or for that matter, any state sponsor, uh, Iranians, North Koreans, Chinese, uh, with any, any meddling they may be doing? Um, so first, I think a public discussion and acknowledgement of the activity is a good positive first step because it shines a, a flashlight on this, if, if you will. It illuminates a significant issue that I think we all have to, have to deal with. There's a variety of ongoing efforts, both within the government as well in the private sector in terms of how do we harden our defenses. I think we also need to have a discussion about just what, for example, does critical infrastructure mean in the 21st century? I don't think we traditionally would have thought of an election infrastructure as critical. We traditionally viewed critical infrastructure as something that generated an industrial output, aviation, electricity, finance. I don't think we've traditionally thought about it in the informational kind of dynamic. I think that's a challenge for us coming ahead. And then continued partnership between the elements within the government as well as in the private sector, that's the key to the future to me. Uh, so ju just for the record, I also had a whole list of specific questions about individuals and or circumstances that don't want to be repetitive and have you say I can't comment on them. But I would anticipate when we move to classified session uh, that this committee will be able to explore some of those, uh, uh, some of those situations in a little more depth. Um, I have uh, a couple of other questions about the um, about the the Russian intervention, but I, I don't have enough time to get into it right now, Mr. Okay. If you could give me a couple minutes when we get to the next round. Okay. So very briefly, um, um, the if you can describe the elements of the Russia's active measures in the campaign in the 2016 election, uh, we've only got. 35 seconds, but that's the first thing I want to get into about exactly what they were doing, if you can tell us anything about that. So we saw cyber used. We saw the use of external media. We saw the use of disinformation. We saw the use of leaking of information, much of which was not altered. I mean, we saw several, if you will, common traits that we have both seen over time, as well as I would argue that the difference this time was the, the, the cyber dimension and the fact that the release of so much information that they had extracted via cyber is, the, is a primary tool to try to drive an outcome. So in this setting, can you talk to us at all about what tools they used? I'm not going to go into the specifics of how they executed the hacks. I, I apologize, no, sir. Uh, we'll try to get into that in classified. I'll <clears throat> hold off for now. Thank you. Gentleman yields back. Uh, Mr. Schiff's recognized for 15 minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just had a couple of follow-up questions. Um, 
Dr. Comey, can you tell me what an SF-86 is? SF-86? Yes. It's the standard background clearance form that all of us who are hired by the federal government and want to have access to classified information fill out. Would uh, someone who is uh, an incoming national security advisor have to fill out an SF-86? Yes, I think so. That SF-86 um, require that the applicant disclose uh, any payments received from a foreign power? I think so. I mean, the form is the form. I think so. And foreign travel as well. Um, I make a request uh, through you to the Justice Department or whatever IC component uh, would have custody of Mr. Flynn's SF-86. I make a request uh, that that be provided to the committee. Uh, and I yield now to uh, Mr. Carson. Thank you, Ranking Member. I'd like to focus my line of questioning on Russia's views toward Ukraine. In March 2014, Russia illegally annexed the Ukrainian territory of Crimea, Crimea, beginning a conflict which has effectively yet to be resolved. Admiral Rogers, can you please briefly describe, as you understand it, sir, how Russia took Crimea? Um, I would argue to the insertion of military force. They occupied it and physically removed it from Ukrainian control. Sir, we've heard terms like little green men and hybrid warfare. Uh, can you please explain how these relate to Russia and Ukraine? So on the Ukraine side, what we saw was over time, rather than the, the kind of overt kind of activity, we saw to such a degree on the Crimea side, what we saw was a much bigger effort on the influence and the attempts to um, distance Russian actions from any potential blowback to the Russian state, if you will, and then hence the use of the little green men, surrogates in military, unmarked military uniforms, the, the flow of information, the, the provision of resources to support um, the forcible separation of the Ukraine. Admiral, has Russia returned Crimea back to Ukraine, sir? No. Do they have intentions to? They publicly indicated that they will not. Admiral, why does Russia even care about Ukraine? I'm sure in their view, they view that this is a primary national interest for them. It's on the immediate periphery of the Russian state. Am I right, sir, that they see it as a part of their, global, their broader objective to uh, influence um, and impact uh, Russia's, uh, Ukraine's desire for self-determination? Yes. I think that's part of it. Sir, as Russia tried to claim stolen territory in Ukraine, the U.S. and the rest of the world saw the annexation <coughs> for what it was, crime. Shortly after Russia invaded, the United Nations essentially declared it a crime in a non-binding resolution. And our own government, recognizing the seriousness of the event, instituted new sanctions against Russia. Is that right, sir? Yes, sir. Now, this was a time where much of the world was united. Russia invaded another country and illegally annexed its territory, as we all stood shoulder to shoulder with Ukraine. Now, one person who didn't see it that way, however, was President Donald Trump. On July 30th, in an interview with ABC News, Mr. Trump said of Putin, and I quote, He's not going into Ukraine, okay? Just so you understand, he's not going into Ukraine, all right? End quote. Now, Admiral, hadn't Putin already gone into Ukraine two years before and hadn't left? We're talking about that Crimea and influence in the Ukraine generally, yes, sir. And he still hasn't left, correct, sir? Now we're starting to get into some very technical questions about are the Russians physically in the Ukraine? Is it, is it surrogates? The, the Crimea is a very clean example, though, to me. They outright invaded with armed military force and have annexed it. But are they effectively still in Ukraine? They're certainly um, supporting the ongoing effort in the Ukraine to, sp to split that country. We'll get back to Mr. Trump in a minute. First, tell me, sir, what, what, what would it mean to Russia and to Putin to have sanctions lifted? Uh, clearly, even easing of economic impact, greater flexibility, more resources. Now, according to NATO analysis, the Russian economy shrunk by as much as 3.5 percent 
in 2015 and had no growth in 2016, in big part because of Western sanctions, especially those against the oil and gas industry. Now, we're talking about a loss of over $135 billion just in the first year of sanctions. That's a huge sum of money. And sanctions aren't meant to push their economy over a cliff, but to put long-term pressure on Putin to change his behavior. Putin himself said in 2016 that sanctions are severely harming Russia. So we know they've had success in putting pressure on the Kremlin. Admiral, what would it mean geopolitically? Would Sir. it help? Would it help legitimate Russia's illegal land grab? Sir, I'm not. I'm not in a position to talk broadly about the geopolitical implications. I mean, we have stated previously, from an intelligence perspective, we tried to out, we have tried to outline to policymakers the specifics of the Russian invasion of Crimea, the specifics of the continued Russian support to separatists in the Ukraine, the Russians' continued to attempt to pressure and to keep the Ukraine weak. Would it help cleave the United States from her allies? If we remove the sanctions? There's a, lot of stake, there's a lot at stake here for Russia. This is big money, big strategic implications. If they can legitimate their annexation of Crimea, what's next? Are we looking at a new Iron Curtain descending across Eastern Europe? You know, most in our country recognize what is at stake and how the United States, as a leader of the free world, is the only check on Russian expansion. So, back to Mr. Trump and his cohort. At the Republican convention in July, Paul Manafort, Carter Page, and Trump himself changed the Republican Party platform to no longer arm Ukraine. So, the same month that Trump denied Putin's role in Ukraine, his team weakened the party platform on Ukraine. And, as we have and will continue to hear, this was the same month that several individuals in the Trump orbit held secret meetings with Russian officials, some of which may have been on the topic of sanctions against Russia for their intervention in Ukraine. Now, this is no coincidence in my opinion. In fact, the dossier written by former MI6 agent Christopher Steele alleges that Trump agreed to sideline Russian intervention in Ukraine as a campaign issue, which is effectively a priority for Vladimir Putin. There is a lot in the dossier that is yet to be proven, but increasingly, as we'll hear throughout the day, allegations are checking out. And this one seems to be as accurate as they come. In fact, there is also one pattern I want to point out before yielding back. Manafort, fire. Page, fire. Flynn, fire. Why? They were hired because of their Russian connections. They were fired. However, because their connections became public, they were effectively culpable. But they were also the fall guys. So I think after we hear Mr. Quigley's line of questioning, we might guess who could be next. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Ranking Member, I yield back. I yield the uh, balance to Representative Speer. Thank you, Ranking Member. Thank you, gentlemen, for your service um, to our country. You know, I think it's really important as we sit here that we explain this to the American people in a way that they can understand it. Why are we talking about all of this? So my first question to each of you is, is Russia our adversary? Mr. Comey? Yes. Mr. Rogers? Yes. Is, do they intend to do us harm? They intend to ensure, I believe, that they gain advantage at our expense. Director Comey? Yes, I want to be, uh, harm can have many meanings. They're an adversary, and so they want to resist us, oppose us, undermine us in lots of different ways. So one of the terms that we hear often is hybrid warfare. And I'd like to just um, give a short definition of what it is. It blends conventional warfare, irregular warfare, and cyber warfare. The aggressor intends to avoid attribution or retribution. So would you say that 
Russia engaged in hybrid warfare in its effort to undermine our democratic process and engage in our electoral process. Director Comey? I don't think I would use the term warfare. I think you'd, you'd want to ask experts in the definition of war. They engaged in a multifaceted uh, campaign of active measures to undermine our democracy uh, and hurt one of the candidates and, and hope to help one of the other candidates. I'd agree with the director. All right. Well, thank you both. I actually think that their engagement was an act of war, an act of hybrid warfare, and I think that's why the American people should be concerned about it. Now, in, in terms of trying to understand this, I, I think of a, a spider web with a tarantula in the middle. And the tarantula, in my view, is Vladimir Putin who is entrapping many people to do his bidding and to engage with him. And I would include those like Roger Stone and Carter Page and Michael Caputo and Wilbur Ross and Paul Manafort and Rex Tillerson. Uh, I'd like to focus first on Rex Tillerson in the three minutes I have here. Uh, he was the CEO of ExxonMobil. In 2008, he said that the likelihood of U.S.-Russia businesses um, was, in fact, a, a poor investment, that Russia was a poor investment climate. That was in 2008. In 2011, he closed a $500 billion deal with Rosneft Oil. The CEO of Rosneft is Igor Sechin, who is a confident of President Putin, second most powerful man in Russia, and probably a former KGB agent. The deal gives Exxon access to the Black Sea and the Kara Sea and Siberia for oil development. Rosneft gets minority interest in Exxon in Texas and the Gulf. Rex Tillerson um, calls Sechin a good friend. In 2012, Mr. Tillerson and Mr. Sechin go on a road show here in the United States to talk about this great deal that they had just consummated. Also in 2012, there's a video of President Putin and Mr. Tillerson toasting champagne at the deal. And in 2013, Mr. Tillerson receives the Russian Order of Friendship. And he sits right next to President Putin at the event. So my question to you, Director Comey, is, is it a value to President Putin knowing what you know of him and that his interest in doing harm to us is it of benefit to Mr. Putin to have Rex Tillerson as the Secretary of State? I can't answer that question. Admiral Rogers? Ma'am, I'm not, I'm not in a position to answer that question. All right. So in 2014, uh, Igor Session is sanctioned. And he laments that he no longer will be able to come to the United States to motorcycle ride with Mr. Tillerson. Uh, could you give me um, an understanding of what are some of the reasons that we impose sanctions? Director Comey? On Sechin? Well, just in general. 